Please open your Bible with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. That's powerful, Ian. Thank you. Genesis chapter 8. Let me explain where we are planning to go for the next three Sundays, counting today. Um, Greg and I have just wrapped up a Sunday school series uh, on church and state issues. And um, we have just run into the text in Matthew where Jesus gives one of the most important statements he ever makes about church and state issues when he's asked about paying taxes to Caesar. And I thought, you know, we're in the middle of an election year, politics is everywhere you look. Uh, it would be nice to slow down for a moment, and I want to give a little bit of a recap uh, of some of the foundations Greg and I were trying to lay in our series today. Next Sunday, our, my plan is to go to Matthew 22 and see what Jesus says about Caesar, and uh, really about the government and about God. And then on the third week, uh, I plan to uh, apply some of that to how we're supposed to think about Voting in an election season, what are some principles we can think about as we try to think about voting, as we think about politics? What are some principles we can take from what we've seen this week and next week uh, to apply that to, uh, to our current situation as a culture? So today I'm going to read from the covenant with Noah called the Noahic Covenant. This is Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 through chapter 9, verse 17. It's a long text, and I'm going to end up rereading parts of it as the sermon progresses this is the word of the Lord again, uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. This is right after Noah and his family come off the ark. Uh, Genesis 8, verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart, the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered." Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I have given you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. And for your life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you... Be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh." When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, as we live both in the already and not yet of your kingdom, we are already part of Christ's kingdom. We are already alive in Christ, and yet we are not yet resurrected. We are not yet in the new creation. We are in the in-between. God, I pray that you would give us insight how to live as most fundamentally citizens of heaven, but still for us in this room, citizens of at least some country. For most of us, this country, the United States of America. So God, I pray that you would give us insight into how you relate to human government, how we're supposed to think about these issues from a biblical perspective, 
what the role of government is, what the role of the church is, how these things uh, intersect or interconnect in any way. God, I pray that you would give clarity and give help. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing a lot of my outline from Kevin DeYoung, but also from a man named David Van Drunen, who's written some very helpful things on these issues. But Kevin DeYoung has been especially helpful in putting together the outline for this message. So let me just kind of give you the, the, the end at the very beginning. So my argument is heading toward this direction, that God has given to the government or to the state the sword, which Romans 13 describes, the sword, which is a kind of coercive force uh, in order to get people to do what they should do as part uh, as citizens of a country. God has also given the church a different kind of authority, which is called the keys, the keys of the kingdom. That has to do with church discipline, right doctrine, sound teaching. Those are the keys of the kingdom, which are in Matthew 16 and 18, or discussed in that relationship. And then the, the state has the sword. And we want to try to get clarity on these two things. So today, we're going to spend most of our time on the state. And it's really going to take a minute of laying foundation before I really even get to the state. But we're going to start with the covenant with Noah. Now, maybe you're sitting there going, hmm, we, we love the rainbow. We love Noah's covenant. This is great. But what in the world does that have to do with our current uh, situation with the government? How are we supposed to think about the state? Well, I, I would argue that the Noahic covenant is actually laying the foundations biblically for uh, governments and for how the state should operate. And I think Paul in his writings in Romans 13 confirms that through the many parallels with this passage in front of us. So, let's jump in here. Uh, we had a Sunday school series a year or so ago where we called progressive covenantalism, and we walked through some of the major covenants in the Bible. We argued for a covenant with creation with Adam in the beginning, and then we argued for a covenant with Noah, and then a covenant with Abraham, Moses, David, and then eventually you have the covenant through Christ with the church, the new covenant. And we're going to be heading toward the, Lord, the Lord's table, and that's about the new covenant. This is the sign of the new covenant. Uh, but before we get there, I want to discuss the covenant with Noah. And it's interesting because the covenant with Noah is one of these interesting covenants that is not primarily a redemptive covenant. It's not a salvific covenant per se. It's more a covenant of preservation than of redemption. And that's going to be important. If you think of this as like, imagine there's a stage up here, imagine you have a play on this stage. I don't know how that would go, but imagine you have a play up here on the stage, and you have a bunch of actors playing their parts. Um, the drama that's unfolding on the stage here with these actors interacting and saying their lines, the drama that's unfolding is the, really why you would be there to see the play. You want to see the drama unfold, but it would be very, very hard to have a play unfold if you did not have a setting in which for the play to happen, right? You've got to have the stage or the setting to be in place in order for the drama of the play to happen. Are you following me here? You gotta have a stage in order to have the play take place. And if the drama is not a play, but the drama is the drama of God's redemptive work in Christ, that has to have a place in which to unfold. There has to be a world in which Christ can be born and laid in the manger and live a perfect life and die a substitutionary death and be buried and raised. There has to be a, 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 a setting wherein which those actions can take place. And which covenant is it that preserves the stage? That's the covenant with Noah, and we're going to argue, I'm going to argue, that the government has not a saving role. The government's not here to save your soul. The government is here to help with a kind of uh, justice, a kind of preservation of the natural order to hold things together, keep things from veering into anarchy and chaos and death. The government is meant to hold things in order to a, to a certain extent. No government is perfect, obviously. That's the goal, so that God's redemptive purposes can take place in this world. That's kind of where we're going. And I want to try to answer some questions. Again, these questions, I'm getting some of the wording from Kevin DeYoung. Let me just start with these questions. You don't have to write these down. Uh, it's a number of them. There's six of them, so I don't know if you have time to write these down, but I'll, I'll, I'll tick through these, and here we go. So question number one, what is this covenant, the Noahic covenant? What, what exactly is this covenant? If you got your Bible, flip backwards to Genesis chapter three. Really, you can look at the tail end of chapter two. The last two verses, Adam and Eve are... Be, they're one flesh, they're naked and not ashamed, sin has not entered the world, everything is perfect, sinless. Then chapter 3, the serpent comes in, Adam and Eve sin, there's rebellion, they are kicked out of the garden. At the end of chapter 3, he drove them out of the garden, there's no way back in, there's, a, uh, there's the uh, cherubim guarding the way back with a flaming sword, verse 24 of chapter 3. You look at chapter 4, the first children are born, Cain and who? Cain and Abel. And as you probably know, Cain murders his brother. If you look down at verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. 
So the first son born becomes the first murderer. Look down later in the chapter. You have a man named Lamech. Look at verse 23. He's the first polygamist in the Bible. That's not a good sign. And he's also a very violent and vengeful man. Verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, plural, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for what? For wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. Now, do you see? This is a downward spiral of depravity. And if you're used to the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it is a downward spiral into an abyss of sin, right? First child born becomes a murderer. Soon after, you have a polygamist who's, who brags that he killed a man for striking him. So he overcorrects, right? He gets struck and he overcorrects. He kills and then brags about it later. Is the world heading in a good direction? No, it is not. Violence is erupting. Look at chapter 6 of Genesis. This is right before the flood. We'll skip the confusing text about the Nephilim for right now. Look at verse 5 of Genesis 6. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And if you look over at verse 11 of chapter 6, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. There is a lot of murder going on in this world. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their ways on the earth. Verse 13 of chapter 6. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. Okay? So then Noah builds the ark. God sends the flood. As the flood waters subside, that is when Noah leaves the ark and he sacrifices animals as a pleasing aroma to God, and God makes this covenant. Now, this is crucial, I think, to understand what is going on in this text. God has said that the sinful world that he has created, has, well, he made the world perfect. The world has turned sinful, evil, murderous, violent, and corrupt. And so God says, okay, I am grieved over the sin of mankind, and I'm going to wipe the world clean. He brings the flood. He wipes the world clean with only eight people left, righteous Noah and his family. You're thinking, okay, it's looking pretty good. We got this godly man, Noah, and we got his family. And before you know it, you know what happens. Noah gets drunk. He's an, an exposed in a tent. His sons have corruption amongst themselves. Is it looking good even for Noah and his family? No. So we need a Savior who is going to be greater than Noah. We need, we need the ultimate Savior who can bring the salvation that uh, that we don't deserve, but that we need. But here's the point. After the flood has ended, look at chapter 8 now. Look down at verse 21. Noah offers the clean animals. Look at verse 21. Before I read this, rem remember, we just read, in, before the flood, people were doing only evil continually. Remember that? People were only evil continually. Look after the flood. Has the problem of human beings' sin been fixed? Verse 21 of chapter 8. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Has the sin problem been fixed by the global flood? No. Man is still sinful from his youth. So here's what we need to know about the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant. The point is this. This covenant is not meant to fix the sin problem. God is putting this in place in order to curve and curtail the worst of sin and to preserve the world while God comes to send his redemptive promise through Christ. So who, is, uh, who exactly is this covenant uh, made with? Well, it's made with everybody. Look at chapter 9, verse 8. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature, birds, livestock, every beast of the earth, as many as come out of the ark, every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. I love how Tom Schreiner, a New Testament scholar, says it. he says it like this, God pledged in this covenant that humanity will not be annihilated before the promise of Genesis 3 15 is realized. So you say, what is that? That's the promise given to Eve that she would bear a child one day. She thought it might be Cain, I think, but it wasn't Cain. A distant child would come. He would crush Satan's head, the serpent's head, and in the process, he would be bitten in the heel. That is going to be Christ who will crush and overturn the works of Satan, but in the process, he will be injected with the venom of our sin. He will die in our place. And so God is going to sustain the world so that God's redemptive plan can unfold. 
Okay, question number two. So that's what the covenant is. Question number two, what is the sign of the covenant? Well, you know the, the sign is, is the rainbow, but let's read it. Nine, chapter 9, verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. So, you, you, many of you may already know this, but the, it's not the word rainbow in Hebrew. It's just the word bow. It's the exact same word used for a warrior's bow in battle, a warrior's bow. And I think that is what is intended by the, by the rainbow. When you see a rainbow, think a warrior's bow, okay? That's what you're thinking. And what God is saying symbolically is, I brought justice on this world. I aimed my bow of cosmic justice at the sinful world, full of violence and evil everywhere. And I shot an arrow down at planet Earth, and I flooded the Earth with water. That was how my bow hit the Earth. It caused a global flood, and all but eight died. And God says, okay, even though what generation since Noah's generation has deserved another flood? Every single one. All of us are born depraved. All of us are sinful from birth. He says, from, from youth, we are still evil. God says, every generation deserves a global flood. But here's the deal. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take my warrior's bow, and I'm going to take it away from pointing down at earth, and I'm going to hang it up in the clouds. I'm going to hang my warrior's bow in the clouds. I am not going to give every single human generation exactly what it deserves, when it deserves. Instead, I am going to give the gift of patience and long-suffering and kindness and common grace to a world that deserves none of that. And I am going to uphold this world. Seed time and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat, day and night shall not cease until my redemptive plan is over. So I am going to mercifully sustain this whole world working as it does. Now, are there, as we've seen recently, tragic and devastating natural disasters and hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and diseases? Yes, that is absolutely a mark of a fallen world, and, and that is absolutely true. But there is not going to be global destruction and catastrophic destruction of a flood ever again, and it will be global destruction when Christ returns at the very end. But until then, God is going to sustain the world, and the sign every single day is that the warrior's bow is hanging up in the sky. It's interesting. This is not a bloody sign. Circumcision through the Abrahamic covenant was a bloody sign. Uh, the Passover involved putting blood on the doorpost. It was a bloody sign. The new covenant, this cup is the blo my blood shed for many. In, in the new this, blood, this cup is my blood of the covenant shed for many for the remission of sins. So there's, there is blood represented even in the table before us today. But this is not a bloody sign. I think cluing us in, this is not a redemptive covenant. This is a preservative covenant that God is, uh, God is working through the rainbow. Okay, question number three. How long will this covenant last? Look at, I just want you to see it. 822. 822. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And look at 916. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So, the Noahic covenant is ongoing today. I don't want to confuse you. The Hebrew word for everlasting doesn't always mean what the English word everlasting means. The Hebrew word can mean for many generations, for a very long time. It can also mean forever and ever. I don't think the Noahic covenant is going to last forever and ever. It says as long as the earth remains. That's the parameters of the Noahic covenant. As long as the earth remains, 8 to 22. So God has promised he will sustain this world until his redemptive purposes are over, and then there will be a new heavens and a new earth after Christ returns. So how long does it last? It lasts long enough to where we are participating in the Noahic covenant right now. When you see a rainbow after it rains, just know that is really God saying to a watching world, I am keeping my promise. Question number four, with whom, with whom is the covenant made? And again, this is all of humanity, but remember, this is all of humanity in a post-fall world. This is all of humanity in a post-fall world. Look at 916. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So God has made this covenant with the entire world, all humans, and all animals. Question number five, what are the conditions of the covenant with Noah? I told this story in Sunday school, but I'll tell it again. Uh, my wife and I once saw a children's Bible, well, a children's storybook of Noah's flood. 
Okay, it's a little tiny storybook. It's from decades ago. And uh, some people who write children's curricula, Christian children's curricula, need to, need to have an editor who comes back and checks what is written. But what they wrote was, at the end of the story of Noah in the children's Bible, and I don't have the exact wording because I couldn't find it, but I have it somewhere in my house, I think. But at the very end somewhere, it says something like this. God will never again send a flood to, to, fl to flood the whole earth as long as we are good. Or something like that. As long as we try hard to be good. Or something like that. I thought that's the most horrifying misnomer of the Bible. So a child does something wrong. Is there going to be a global flood today? No. No, there's not. So this is the glory of, first of all, you got to get your, check your, if you're buying a, a Bible book for your kids, read it first if possible. Okay, you got to check those things ahead of time, parents, because you never know. But that is definitely a misinterpretation of what the Bible says. This is the glory of the Noahic covenant. Strictly speaking, what are the conditions for us? There are no conditions for us. That doesn't mean we go off and sin that grace may abound. That's not the point. The point is, no matter what happens on earth, is God going to be faithful to see his redemptive purposes come to their fruition and their end? Yes. So human beings cannot screw this up. God is going to maintain the, the world as it is until Christ returns. That's just his promise. He's going to do that no matter what. But that doesn't mean there are not real implications of this covenant for us. So, there are three things, and one of these things is really important. They're all really important, but one's really important for our purposes. There are three things that should characterize us as a result of the covenant with Noah. So, these three things may not seem like much at first glance. The more you stare at them, and if you read other theologians about this, the more you will realize a lot is going on in these three little things. And these three things, I'll tell you what they are. They are dealing with what is absolutely necessary for the human race to survive in a post-fall, post-flood world. These are the minimal things necessary for the human race to survive. Be fruitful and multiply, right? So fruitfulness, or you could say family and fruitfulness. Number two, food. It's kind of important, and that's in this, right? He talks about you don't just have to eat plants. I, I, I'm very thankful for that verse. You can eat meat as well, right? There it is, right there in the text. You can eat meat as well. Um, that, that's number two, food. And then number three is going to relate to our fellow man. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about these in, in order briefly. The last one takes the most time. Number one, look at chapter nine, verse one again. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Are we still underneath that today? Yes, we are still under that. It just I know you know this. We talked about it in the summer for several weeks about marriage, but just flip back since we're in Genesis. Look back at chapter one of Genesis real quick. I, I know you know this stuff. If you were here this summer, you really know it. But Genesis chapter one, just understand, be fruitful and multiply comes in a context of gender and family. Okay, just, this, just crystal clear in the text. Look at this, chapter one, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and then go over to chapter 2, I know we're moving a lot, chapter 2, verse 24, Adam is presented with Eve, it was not good for him to be alone, God makes a helper fit for him, verse 23 of chapter 2 then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, that's family, and hold fast to his wife. This is a new family being formed. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Okay, so do you see in the context of Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. Does that include a man marrying a woman and having children, right? That, that's, that's the context, fathers and mothers and children and male and female and marriage and procreation. So the context here is family and fruitfulness. That's going to be necessary for the human race to survive. And we see that in, with Noah. Number two is food. Look at chapter nine of Genesis verse, let's, let's look at verse two. Look at the end of verse two. He talks about the animals and the birds. And he says at the very end of verse two, this is chapter 9, verse 2, the very end. Into your hand they, that is the animals, are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, Adam and Eve were vegetarians, right? So as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. 
but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. So here, I think that what that's saying there is we're not going to be like animals, just out there attacking animals and eating them like the way animals do. We're going to do this in a, in a, in a proper way. But the point is, God has given us food in order to uh, continue the human race. And then number three, this is going to be really important for where we want to go with the issue of government. Fellow man, okay? Look with me at Genesis chapter 9. We're still right here. And look at verses 5 and 6. These are such important verses for government. And I would say this is the foundational building block for human government in society right here. Genesis 9 verse 5. And for your life blood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Now just stop here. Can everybody tell what we're talking about in this verse? Lifeblood would be what? If you take someone's lifeblood, you have killed that person. And he's talking about animals that kill people and people who deliberately kill people, right? That, those are the two categories. And if an animal kills a person, the animal is meant to be put to death. And if a person deliberately kills a person, if the, uh, de the Bible does distinguish between involuntary manslaughter and deliberate murder, that's all in the Bible. But if a, if a person deliberately and intentionally commits homicide with, with, with uh, malice aforethought, if, so, if someone does that, they are meant to be reckoned with by God. And here's what he says, verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, that is whoever murders someone, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. So, I think this is clearly talking about capital punishment. I am not an expert on how this stuff works out in real life. Uh, I, I understand that in the real world, People who are not guilty have been falsely accused or they've been imprisoned or even on death row and then later DNA evidence shows that they weren't really guilty of the crime they committed 28 years ago and they're set free from death row. Do some people get death penalty when they shouldn't? That is a wonderfully important discussion that needs to be had and our governments need to be as just and right as they possibly can be on those issues. I'm not an expert on that. I'm not here to talk about how you apply this in the real life, but you, we've got to find some way to apply it justly. But is the principle here in this text? It could not be clearer. If, if, a, if a man sheds the blood of man, God ordains that by man his blood shall be shed. Why? Because the person who was murdered was an image bearer of God. And so God, in order to, to show the sanctity of the individual, by the way, all people are made in the image of God, not just Christians, right? So anybody who is murdered, that person needs justice in God's world. And here, God is not going to bring about the justice himself directly by bringing another flood. God's holding back on his final cosmic justice. So who's supposed to do this? Whoever sheds the blood of man, but not by God shall his blood be shed, but what? By man shall his blood be shed. This is the beginning of what becomes government and society. Because there has to be some way for this to be carried out through, through justice. It can't be vigilante, right? Where, you know, you hurt me and I hurt you. That's what that guy Lamech did. You strike me, I'm going to murder you back. That's what Lamech did in chapter uh, 4. We need justice to be done. This is the principle that's going to lead to our governmental system. Why do we need this? Because people in our world, we tend to do what Lamech did. If someone, you know, if someone cuts you off in traffic, you want more than to cut them off in traffic. <laughs> There's part of us that wants to over-punish, right? Over-correct when we are wrong. And so this principle, now listen, if the government is given the ultimate principle of protecting life and even taking life, I would argue that this principle is a greater to the lesser. If the government is meant to protect murder and to take human life in the case of a murderer, should it also protect you from, being, from stuff being stolen from your house, from someone stealing your car, from someone hurting you in a lesser way? Yes, I would argue from greater to the lesser, if murder and capital punishment is included, then lesser things are also going to be included. The government is called to protect and care for the individuals within that jurisdiction. Now, I want you to uh, leave this text and I want you to go with me to Romans 13. Everyone knows probably Romans 13 is a classic text on God and government. Romans chapter 13. And I, I plan to refer to this text on future weeks. And I know it's familiar, but I still want to read the whole seven verses, if you, or at least the first uh, five verses for right now. Romans chapter 13, 
and see if you see some parallels with the covenant with Noah. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. We're definitely talking about government here. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. So you see here, God has given the sword, the coercive power of the sword to the state. And as you know, when Paul wrote this, Caesar wasn't a godly man. Caesar was Nero. And Nero, the very man who is the Caesar, when Paul wrote Romans, is the very man who's going to have Paul beheaded uh, about a decade after he wrote this letter. So Paul doesn't have some sort of naive understanding of human governments right here. He's talking about Nero, and he says, God has put him in place, just like God put Pharaoh in place back in the Exodus, and God has a purpose for this man as depraved as that man was, and so far as we can in good conscience, we are to submit to them. They have got the sword, and they will bring God's justice, the sword here being ultimately referring to the coercive power of the state, especially expressed in putting to death, for instance, a murderer or something of that nature. Now, let me summarize a couple thoughts here about the government, make a quick comment about church and then we will head toward the Lord's table. So here, here are some, some thoughts here about government. And these are from David Van Drunen, mostly. So here's what we see. In the Noahic covenant, which gives the grounds for government, what we find is it's made with all creation, not just Israel, not just the church, not just God's holy people. It's made with who? It's made with the entire human race. So is government for the whole human race? Yes, I know that's obvious, but I think it's grounded in the text. Number two, the Noahic Covenant, which gives the foundation of government, is aimed at preservation of the human race, not the redemption of the human race. Paul is not looking to Caesar to save his soul. Believe me, that's not what he's thinking. He is looking to governments to preserve the, the, the order of society, to prevent anarchy, and hopefully to allow for the free preaching of the gospel. Uh, I think Greg covered this maybe in a few weeks ago in the college class, I think 1 Timothy 2, but remember the, the text 1 Timothy 2, to pray for leaders and kings and all in authority. Why? That we might live quiet, peaceful lives because God wants all people to be saved. So the point is this, we want a peaceful government that allows the free preaching of the gospel. That's what we want. We want a well, government that's not going to try to interfere with the preaching of the gospel, not going to try to put us in jail for the preaching of the gospel. That's what we hope for. If we don't get that, we preach the gospel no matter what, right? We obey God rather than man. If, if at the end of the day, people say you cannot, you can't preach the gospel without facing jail time, then we face jail time. But we don't wish jail time upon ourselves, okay? We don't wish that. We're not aiming for that. People say, well, trials improve the church. I understand. And if God brings those trials, he will, he will sanctify us. But we should not pray that God bring anarchy and chaos and destruction. We should pray 1 Timothy 2, peaceful and quiet lives that we might freely proclaim the gospel that all peoples would be saved. That should be the goal. So the goal of government is to allow a peaceful environment where in which the gospel can be freely proclaimed. But the, go the government is not the one preaching the gospel. They are preserving order so that we can preach the truth of Christ. So it's preservative, not redemptive. Number three, this is also important, government, the Noahic covenant, is for this age and not eternity. It's temporary. So this is very important. In Philippians, the end of chapter three, Paul says, okay, real quick, he's talking to Philippians. I think next semester, one of the Sunday schools is going to be going through Philippians. The Philippians had great pride in their Roman citizenship and their Roman status. They were considered almost like a little Rome away from Rome. Philippi was a very Roman, a very proud to be Roman city. And Paul says to the Philippians, your citizenship is not fundamentally Roman citizenship. Your citizenship is in heaven and from which we await the Savior who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. So here's what Paul's saying. Our most fundamental allegiance is not being American. It's being a citizen of heaven, correct? Our most fundamental allegiance is to Christ, our Lord in heaven, not whatever earthly citizenship we have on earth. But 
It doesn't mean we don't have earthly citizenship on earth. Did Paul, in the book of Acts, claim his Roman citizenship? Remember Acts 22? He's tied up, about to be whipped without just grounds. And he says, hey, are you going to whip a Roman citizen without a trial? And the guy's like, oh, no. Are you a Roman citizen? He says, yes, I am. He said, well, I paid a lot of money for my citizenship. How did you, you poor man, how did you get a citizenship? I was born with one. Oh, no, that's even better. Oh, boy, I'm in big trouble. If I whip you without a trial, I'm in big trouble with the people above me, the Roman soldier says. They untie Paul, and he doesn't get whipped. So Paul understands he has dual citizenship, but his heavenly citizenship is infinitely more important than his earthly citizenship, but his earthly citizenship isn't non-citizenship. It's not nothing. And so as we, as we move forward, if we're American citizens, we need to think as Americans about how we can best love our neighbor in the political sphere, although it is not the ultimate sphere. It's temporary. It's preservative. It really matters, but it's not ultimate. It's not eternal, and it's not heavenly. Do you understand the distinction between those two things? Earthly government matters because it affects people's lives in the here and now. It matters, but it's not ultimate. And we need to make sure our allegiance is connected ultimately in heaven, but yes, we are aware of and we are participating to whatever degree we are able in good conscience here, in, here on earth. A couple more comments here. Human government is therefore legitimate. It is legitimate before God. God has instituted them. That's the view Jesus is going to take. Uh, we'll see in next week's text, Lord willing. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. It is legitimate, uh, earthly governments. Number two, those governments are accountable. They are accountable ultimately to God for how they use their limited jurisdiction in this life. You remember Jesus uh, on Friday morning, Good Friday morning, standing before Pontius Pilate, Pilate saying, I've got authority over you. I can let you go. I can have you crucified. Why won't you talk to me? And Jesus says what? You would have no authority over me if it wasn't given to you from my Father in heaven. And that's an amazing response as he is on death row, he looks at the man who has authority to have him killed and says, you would have no authority if it hadn't been given you by God. Do you think Pilate is going to be accountable before God Almighty at the final judgment for what he did to Jesus on that Friday morning? Yes, he is. And the water he used is not going to wash away that sin. That's not how that works. If Pilate ever trusted in Christ, he would have been saved. But there's no evidence that he did trust in Christ. So all human earthly governments are accountable to God. And just as a footnote, Greg and I talked about this just last hour. Even those who don't have the Bible, okay, I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked here for a long thing, but even an earthly governor who has never heard of Jesus and never read the Bible is accountable to the God of the Bible for how he or she rules. Why is that the case? Because God has written his law on our hearts, our consciences bear witness, we know how we should act and not act as far as how we should treat each other, and government should know allowing people to be murdered in the streets is not acceptable, and that should not be allowed. We looked at a text in, in the Old Testament where God condemns uh, pagan nations for allowing uh, abuse of horrific kinds, even if they'd never read the Scripture. Why? Because it's written on their conscience. They know, they know better. So all government is, uh, is, is accountable before God, and government is common. It's not only for the church or God's people. It is for all of humanity. Okay. Say uh, a quick word. I'm going I'm to save most of this for later. The church has the keys of the kingdom, which has to do with dealing with true and false doctrine, uh, Christian life, uh, those kinds of decisions. Let me just give one illustration, and then I'll, I'll move to the Lord's table. Um, how do the two jurisdictions interact? The church has its jurisdiction, the keys of the kingdom, which I'll try to talk about later on another day, and then you've got the, the sword of the state the course of power of the state. And here's an example I gave in Sunday school a while back. To give two quick examples. Number one, uh, if, if heaven forbid, if there's, if there's child abuse that takes place in a church, okay, if that ever happens in a church, uh, God forbid, I mean, those are horrific stories. If you ever read about stories, I, I've heard a story in the 80s where this happened. Here's what happens. There's child abuse that takes place in a church, and the church says, hey, we're going to do church discipline on the guy who did the abuse, but we're not going to contact the authorities, because the Bible says not to go to lawsuits against each other, and so we're just going to do this in-house. We're going to confront the guy, deal with the keys of the kingdom, excommunicate him if necessary, but we're not going to contact the federal, or we're not going to call the police and contact the authorities. That is a massive blunder on that church's part, and they got in huge trouble after this came out in recent years. What they should do is realize this. There are two jurisdictions, but they overlap in this situation. Has a sin been committed in the case of child abuse in a church? Has a horrific sin been committed? Yes. Should the keys of the kingdom deal with church discipline on that individual? 
Yes, that's the church's prerogative. Has a crime also been committed? Yes. Is that the state's jurisdiction to deal with criminal activity against a minor in this case? Yes. So both jurisdictions are weighing in on the same act, but they both have different authorities. One would be church discipline, decrying it as being sinful, and if necessary, removing them from membership, but then call the police because it's not your job, our job as the church to be the wielder of the sword. So the, 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 if there needs to be jail time, that's the state's prerogative to deal with, not the church's prerogative to deal with. You understand how that would both work there? Let me give one other kind of even more obvious illustration. Just take a room like this. There are fire codes on how many people can fit in a room like this. You know, whether it's 400 or whatever it is in this room, there, there's a certain number where you can't go beyond that. Now, that is not at that moment the state interfering with us as the church. They're not getting in our lane. What they're doing is they're saying, we have the job of protecting life. And so we know that if there's 550 people in this room and something were to go wrong, people would not be able to get out on time. There'd be trampling. There'd be a disaster. People could die. So we're not telling you what doctrine to teach from the pulpit. That's not their role. And if they try to do that, we obey God, not man, right? If they try to tell us what to teach, we're not going to go with that. But if they say you have to have a limited of 400 people in this room or whatever the number is, we submit to that. They're not telling us how to run our church. They're telling us how to preserve life on the side of the state. But as soon as they tell us what doctrines to teach or not teach, has Caesar overstepped his bounds? Yes. And do we submit to Caesar when he says, hey, don't teach on the doctrine of hell. Don't ever use the word hell from the pulpit. Are we going to submit to Caesar? No, we are not. We're, we're, we're going to humbly say, I have to obey God rather than man. And it's the church with the keys of the kingdom that determines doctrine that is taught and, and what a consistent Christian life is meant to look like. More on some of those things on future weeks, but I want to move to the Lord's table. And I think there's actually a pretty natural connection. If you will turn with me to our familiar passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's why this table matters. Someone may be a great citizen as far as earthly citizenship goes. They might pay their taxes. They might do what they're supposed to do. They've never had a felony or even a misdemeanor, and they've got a clean record. But listen, before God, God's patience is certainly waiting, and, but God knows all of our sin and all of our wrongs, and there is a day coming where at the final judgment, God is going to reveal the secret intentions of every thought of every heart, and he will reveal them for what they are, and God is going to bring cosmic, perfect justice on that day. See, governments bring proximate justice. They never always get it exactly right. And how many years should someone go to jail for stealing a car? And how many, it, these, these are debatable matters. It's hard to know exactly what the right thing is. God is going to perfectly execute justice on that last day. And for anyone who is outside of Christ, we'll be held accountable for all the things we've ever done wrong and all the right things we failed to do. James says, if you know the right thing to do it and you don't do it, for you it is sin. And think about, just, just think about the sins of omission, the things we have omitted to do that we should have done. I sometimes think the sins of omission are the ones that truly get overlooked in our lives. Think about how many times we should have prayed for that person and we didn't. Think about how many times we should have spoken up with a word of boldness for, before another and we did not. We need to come before Christ humbly and say, Lord, I need the finished work of Jesus. See, the Noahic covenant upheld this world so that Jesus could be crucified in it. And Jesus bled and died, bearing our sin, our shame, and God's judgment on the cross, taking it into the grave and being resurrected. And then he provides these symbols of what he's done to say, this is my body, this is my blood. So let me read for us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. If you are not a Christian today, uh, I hope that you will not come and participate in these elements. These elements are for those who have already turned from sin and trusted in Christ. But if you do not know the Lord, I would ask that even as you sit in your seat, that you would talk to the Lord about where you are, that you would even reach out to him and, and, and entrust yourself to him uh, for forgiveness of sins and a right standing with God. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sin, 
you are not walking in deliberate, willful, unrepentant sin, you may come forward and partake of these elements and then return to your seat rejoicing because of what Christ has done for us. I'm going to give you a brief moment uh, to pray silently, and then I'll pray, and then you may come forward to participate in the elements. So just take a brief moment to prepare your heart in silence, and then I'll pray for us. Lord, we are thankful that you are a God of justice, but it is also a fearful thing that you are a God of justice because none of us is just. None of us has done right, perfectly, completely, not even close. We've all sinned and fallen far short of your glory, but we are justified freely as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And God, I pray that we would entrust ourselves fully to you that we would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if we are already believers, that we would, again, continue to confess sins that we struggle with, that we would repent of them, that even as we come forward, that you would remind us in this physical, tangible way, as we can touch and taste these elements, that these are a tangible reminder of your love for us in Christ, that you were willing to give your one and only son to a shameful death. You did not spare your son any of the pain and suffering that we deserved. And through him now, you are going to graciously give us all that we need. God, be at work at this time as we come forward. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.